second session of James F. Dorian Lecture Series. The title of this uh, session is Bioethics with an Accent. My students at Bioethics class always listen to lectures with an accent. So they might ask why more accented bioethics. And the reason is as follows. The modern bioethics is started and founded in the United States. Actually, we have one of the founders of the discipline with us today, Dr. James F. Drain, is a prominent scholar and one of the founders of the discipline of bioethics. However, because bioethics involves value judgment and decision making based on values, and because different cultures have different sets of values, of, of course they won't be in they, they shouldn't be in contrast with the common heritage of mankind, especially human rights. But in addition to human, universal human rights and freedoms, each culture has its own values, and those values are involved in their decision making on different bioethical issues. In this lecture, we will listen to scholars from different regions of the world, and they will talk to us about their experience and uh, their knowledge, their scholarship in different areas of bioethics, in different cultures, and with different sets of values. Before introducing the first lecturers, I want to thank all my colleagues at Edinburgh University who helped me in holding this event the leadership of the university, all the colleagues who are here, and especially Maria, my uh, assistant at Bioethics Institute, whose work ethics actually is a great asset to Bioethics Institute and to me. Uh, I would like to invite Dr. James F. Drain, the found, one of the founders of Bioethics Discipline, to give welcome remarks. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Drain to the party. Sad to say, just recently died. 
His name is Daniel Callahan. He was widely respected academically for things that he had written, and mainly for the establishment of a new bioethics research center in New York, which is known now worldwide in the area of medicine and ethics. Dan Callahan, very good friend of mine. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the, besides the, the, the new academic discipline which was created by, by Dan and by myself, uh, there are all kinds of programs now around the world in this discipline. Uh, this James F. Drain uh, Bioethics Institute here in Edinburgh was actually the creation of one of the vice presidents of this university. By a big surprise to me, I was coming down the hall one time uh, over in the library and going to do some study. I saw this plaque on the wall. I looked at it and said, James not Drake Bioethics Institute. Hell, that's, that's I. <laughs> now, now what? But that's the way it happens in the world, I guess. <coughs> uh, as I mentioned, it was created by, by a, one, of the, uh, one of the vice presidents of the university, and it's about 50 years ago now. Uh, it was created uh, for research by young scholars from around the world. And these young scholars receive certain amount of support financially to come here and to stay here and to be housed and to be fed here at the university. The Bioethics Institute provides the academic materials for their research. Today, all of you are in attendance and will have an opportunity to meet and to listen to three different bioethics invitees, bioethics scholars that are here this year to do their research. You'll get to know them. They'll be Dr. <coughs> Dr. Olinda Teams from India, Dr. Cornelius Ewusho from Nigeria, and uh, Dr. C Dina Senora from Palestine. They will be enriched by their residence and by their academic projects here at the university. And uh, Edinburgh students, you all, will also be enriched by their being here, by you getting to know them, to talk to them, to hear about the research that they're doing. This will be a benefit to us at the university as well as for all of you individually. <clears throat> the, uh, the Edinburgh students, of course, will benefit, but there will be benefits from their work here transmitted to all sorts of other places, especially to the places from which they come. They'll promote this discipline and they will get to know something about our university. So get ready to listen to them. Stay around for a few minutes if you have time to get to know them, to get to talk to them just a little bit. And uh, I thank you all for coming. Uh, I hope you enjoy their remarks and will learn from them about bioethics and about their lives back home. Now, for the first speaker, we have I, Dr. Oh, you're going to introduce her? Okay, go ahead. I won't mention her name. <laughs> Dr. Kia will tell us who the first speaker is. Thank you. 
Thank you, Dr. Green. Uh, also, I would like to thank all the students who came here on Friday. I appreciate you for taking time. And uh, also, my many thanks to the leadership of the College of Science and Health Professions for their support to the Biotis Institute, invaluable support to the Biotis Institute and for the presence here at the second session of James F. Dorian Lecture Service. I would like to invite Dr. Roy Shin, the Associate Dean of the College of Science and Health Professions, to give our next welcome address today. Thank you. Just last Friday, I had uh, the honor of um, taking one of the new members of the Athletic Hall of Fame to meet with uh, members of the team that she was on um, 20 years ago when she was a student athlete here. And she was from the Czech Republic and has a very um, uh, compelling story. I mean, you know, left her family, got on an airplane with $200, and is still in the U.S. And, um, and so I, one of the messages that I told them was, and, you know, she dramatically improved things at Edinburgh when she came here. I mean, they were like third and fifth best team in the United States. And um, I said to the existing, the current students, what a tradition you come from. And that that is something that is, not everybody gets. And it's, uh, it's the same way here today. You know, talking about uh, Dr. Drain is, uh, is a real honor for me. I was asked to just say a couple, a few personal things. Um, we've known each other for a long time. Um, we taught philosophy courses here uh, in the 60s and 70s and 80s. And um, uh, moral reasoning, religion, and, and medical ethics as well. Um, he talked a little bit about the Bioethics Institute in the year 2000, so 19 years ago. Um, he was named the Russell Roth Professor of Bioethics. So I have that right, Jim? Is that 2000? Um, and he, I don't think he'll mind me telling you that he's 90 years old. He still goes to work every day. Right? So he's a great source of inspiration. Um, <laughs> last year, he published his 21st book entitled Medicine, Ethics, and Religion. So, um, you know, when you're feeling a little down and maybe you know you, you don't have enough energy that day, just think of, think of what this guy does every day. Um, uh, just a couple years ago, maybe a year or two ago, he went and met with his good friend. He's a friend of the Pope. So he met with, uh, had a personal audience with uh, Pope Francis. And uh, my wife, actually grew up across the street from him. And so their families did a lot of uh, things together uh, throughout their, throughout her childhood and, uh, and his children's childhood as well. And are still, you know, are still very good friends, obviously, to that. Um, I was an undergraduate at Edinburgh and never had the good fortune of having Dr. Drain for class. Um, but I taught, um, I later, when I came back and, and was teaching here, I was teaching a professional ethics course, and I went to him for some advice for, you know, what things to highlight and what's how to do it effectively, what matters. I, I, I'm going to guess that there are a number of you in the audience that want to become health professionals, and what drew me to becoming a health profession, health professional was knowing that there was a high standard that when you know when no one else was looking that people in my in our profession chose to do the right thing you know collectively they understood the reason why and so we talked about these things for hours in his living room 
um, you know, the importance of ethical professional practice and research um, across generations and across different circumstances. Because every single generation has to get it right, right? Or else we lose the public trust. So whatever field you're going into, though that population needs to believe that when you make a recommendation to them, it's in their interest, not in your interest, right? Primarily. Uh, we talked about the essential characteristics that were needed in health professionals and how to effectively impart the principles and the why, the rationale, and the courage that you need. Because it's easy to talk about it when there's no heat, right? It's only when there's pressure or an incentive to do the wrong thing, right, that personally benefits you. That's when you have to be able to not just know what the right thing is, but actually follow it, right? Um, so this actually led me into some great things in my own discipline uh, that I really um, benefited greatly from. I was on a national board of ethics and um, presented and published in that area. So it was, um, it was pretty special. Um, Dr. Drain and I have traveled down to Allegheny College, uh, hosts a, an annual um, medical ethics um, lecture series, and we've gone down there several times. Um, every single time, I think, the presenters like knew him, <laughs> and he was just an old friend to them. Um, one was Dr. Hank Tenhave, I hope I didn't push that too bad, of Duquesne Center for Bioethics. And he had a brand new PhD, this was just a couple years ago, had a brand new PhD graduate, or about to be graduate, at the time named Dr. Kia Aramesh, who he recommended for this position, because he, he knew that we were in the process of creating this um, at the time. And so he's perfect. It was like a perfect thing because he's a physician as well as a bioethicist. He can teach biology courses as well as direct the uh, uh, Bioethics Institute. Um, and, and then we added a bioethics course that pretty much all of our health professional students now take early on, which makes a lot of us very happy to see that happen. Um, th there's, a, there's a Catholic hymn entitled, We Are Called, that includes this verse, and it reminds me of Dr. Green whenever I hear it song. We are called to act with justice. We are called to love tenderly. We are called to serve one another to walk humbly with God. Um, about a year ago, there was a popular country song entitled, I Believe Most People Are Good. Some of you may have heard that. That was intended to encourage us to be more open to the goodness in our fellow brothers and sisters. Jim believes all people have goodness within them that just needs guidance, role models, and courage to reveal itself. And he spent a lifetime he continues to do so by helping to mentor Dr. Aramash and the Institute's visiting scholars, um, whose work will be shared this afternoon. Jim, thanks for all you've done for this university, the field of bioethics, and the people fortunate enough to be called your friends. about the research. Uh, the first fellow who will be speaking here is Dr. Uh, Cornelius uh, Evozo, and born and raised in Nigeria. Cornelius is currently a Condolidoc Fellow at the Department of Philosophy at Stellenbosch University in South Africa. 
he was a recipient of the Santander Ethics and Society Scholarship of Theories and Application in like, Theories and Application from Fordham University, an international visiting fellow at the Institute for Medical Ethics and History of Medicine in Rohr University in Bochum, Germany, a visiting scholar at the Center for Biomedical Ethics at, and Law at Catholic University of Leuven in Belgium, and the Center for Research and Bioethics in Uppsala University. Where is Uppsala? Sweden. In Sweden. So, <laughs> for his research stay at the James F. Dwayne, Cornell is working on incidental, incident, ethical issues of incidental findings in, in clinical research. And he is addressing the issue from an Ubuntu perspective. What is an Ubuntu perspective? That's what I am passionate to hear from Dr. Rizzo Please uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Rizzo. Uh, and his lecture is titled Comparing Ubuntu with Western Philosophy as a Foundation for Bioethics. Good afternoon, everyone. I am so sorry about the delay. Uh, my name is Cornelius Yemusho. I am a consolidated fellow, currently a consolidated fellow at the Center for Applied Ethics. Stellenbosch University. It is really a great privilege to be here at the university and benefit from Dr. Dream's many years of research in bioethics and Dr. Kea's own research too in bioethics. I have suddenly realized how difficult it is to talk about Ubuntu in just 15 minutes, but I will try my best. My immediate objective today is to show how Ubuntu, or to argue the thesis that Ubuntu philosophy is a useful philosophy that can supplement current medical ethics guidelines and ethical approaches, 
legal codes, and be of assistance in addressing a variety of bioethical issues. Um, now I'm wearing all black because I'm actually playing with a new idea. It's either going to end up in my funeral or in my victory. But I hope it will be in my victory. Last year at the University of Oxford, I attended a conference where one of the speakers narrated a story of a couple in self-discondent relationship. The couple, the husband and the wife, had approached their physician for a regular checkup. Blood samples were drawn and both parties agreed that those samples should go to the lab for a test. The test results came back with surprising outcomes. The test results show that the husband was HIV positive, but the wife was negative. The physician informs the husband about the results and says she plans to let the wife know about the husband's serial conversion. But the, the man, for fear of losing his wife, told the physician that he wants his own private information kept confidential. But this is the problem. Both husband and wife are patients of this particular physician. And when the physician, when the presenter narrated this story, he described the story as one of the ethical issues which keep doctors away often at night. The case is a typical example of the conflict between, or the conflict that can occur between the duty to one and the duty to maintain patient's confidentiality. As a young bioethics student, we were told that whenever we are faced with ethical issues, you should proceed this way. First, search through the norms, the available legal codes for guidance. And if you cannot find guidance there, go through the professional codes or guidelines. And if you still cannot find adequate guidance, go through adequate guidance. Go through the hospital policies or traditions. Ask your senior colleagues or your senior fellows, ask them the question, how have they treated or addressed similar cases like the ones you are experiencing? And when you still cannot find an adequate guidance, then apply the ethical theories, the ethical approaches. Cell discordancy is at the heart of HIV transmission. And as has been repeatedly confirmed by several empirical studies, most of the new infections occur amongst individuals in several discordant relationships. So stopping the spread of the virus amongst individuals in several discordant relationships will contribute significantly towards the realization of the United, Go United Nations goal to eliminate HIV and AIDS by 2030. There is a way current legal codes and professional guidelines have addressed the conflicts between patient confidentiality and partner notification or the duty to one that is currently undermining the effort to spread, to stop the spread of the virus. In both legal codes and medical guidance, a physician may breach patient confidentiality only when the patient has refused to consider other options of preventing infection. That is, if breaching confidentiality is the only known way of preventing infection. If the patient has communicated a threat to infect others, and those who are at risk are actually identifiable. In the absence of these conditions, patients' right to control his or her own information should always be honored. But this is problematic. An HIV patient, an HIV positive patient, only needs to promise that he or she would consider other options of preventing infection without actually taking advantage of those options. 
In 2010, Professor Mehta and Padikaku conducted a study where they found that between 40% and 65% of those of HIV positive patients who promise to inform their wives or their partners or take advantage of preventive measures actually failed to do so. Do you now know why most of the new infections occur amongst individuals in several discordant relationships? Because the outlook in most legal codes, the outlook in current guidance, which favor patient confidentiality over partner notification, is less likely to ensure that those who are at risk of infection are given an opportunity to take advantage of preventive measures. And some countries and regions like the US and the UK respectively, when notifying a spouse of an HIV positive patient, the physician notifying because the patient has communicated a threat to infect others, the identity of the patient, of the HIV positive patient, must always be protected, be concealed. And this is also problematic. If the spouse was faithful, she would know, he would know who has exposed her to the virus. Most companies, most policies, most hospital policies align with current legal codes, they align with professional guidance. And like most codes, patient confidentiality is a sacred duty. In order for HIV care and transmission to be truly effective, I believe a shift from the question, when is it ethical or legal to breach confidentiality, there is the need for a shift from the question, when is it ethical or legal to breach confidentiality, to when is it ethical or legal not to notify the HIV positive patient's partners? This shift needs to occur. I want us to consider for a moment. But before that, now we have seen that medical guidelines are not very effective in preventing transmission. But what about ethical approaches. <coughs> we could turn to dominant ethical approaches for bringing about this shift. But these dominant theories too are, in my opinion, equally limited. Some top contenders are utilitarianism. For example, the utilitarian theory says that the morality of a nation depends solely on the consequences and consequences matter to the extent that they bring about the happiness of individuals. And the assessment of consequences, each individual's happiness gets equal consideration. It is not always the case. It is not always justice to treat everyone equally. Moreover, Individual rights matter in themselves, not merely because they contribute to the overall uh, happiness. But the issue about confidentiality, about putting so much emphasis on confidentiality, and about how this emphasis is having the effort to stop the spread of the disease, has been adequately described by Dubin in an article he published in. 2009. It says the confidentiality policy also tied the hands of medical doctors, for they had no right to do an HIV or AIDS test on anyone without the patient's consent. If the doctors could gather from various patterns of persistent opportunistic infections or through other investigations, they still had no right to test the patient of HIV. If and when doctors had been given the right to test, and the patient was found positive, the doctors have no power to insist on partner notification, since this would violate the individual rights of the concerned person. Given this policy, they are aware, and there are still many cases where relatives are taking care 
or very sick relatives without knowing the status of their patients. The results are sometimes very tragic. We could also turn to other top contenders. Um, now I want to consider the Kantian ethics. Kantian ethics which defines morally right action as one which enhances an individual's capacity for authority. Kant's second formulation of the categorical imperative appears to be very relevant here. Kant says, act so that you treat humanity, whether in your own person or in the person of another, always as a neck and never as a being's only. This imperative is Kant's basis for respect for person. Based on Kant's second formulation to respect persons, there is really no basis for preferring the husband's right to confidentiality over the wife's right to be notified. So this theory also does not get permissible bias rights. These dominant theories, dominant Western theories, I believe should be supplemented with a relational theory which gets permissible bias rights and can account for the intrinsic value of each person. And I think Ubuntu philosophy is just the right candidate for that. Ubuntu philosophy is an essentially relational philosophy and it has its origins in the oral culture of the Batu people in southern Africa. It emphasizes interdependence, it emphasizes social harmony, and other regarding values. In fact, one becomes more or less of a person to the extent that the individual prizes other regarding values, such as care, such as love, such as respect. And that's the maxim, I am because we are. We are, therefore, I am. Umuntu, Ubuntu, Gabantu. In Marx, in Marx, opinion, the communal character of Ubuntu requires a blend of identifying with others, thinking of oneself as a part of a we, and exhibiting solidarity with others, as showing empathy and caring for the condition of others. A combination of identifying with others and exhibiting solidarity is also required for development of one's person in this philosophy. And that's the ultimate moral rule in the philosophy. If the ultimate moral rule is that the right action is one which connects rather than divide individuals in harmonious relationship. And this is how I believe Ubuntu's emphasis on social coercion, on communal relationship, helps to address the conflicts between patient confidentiality and partner notification and place the emphasis on partner notification. I have formulated two rules from the ultimate rule, but this is what the rules essentially imply. That it is one, a right action is one that connects individuals in a relationship of harmony. The physician in this particular case, the case that I am considering, has a duty to notify the wife of age of the husband's HIV status, since this is necessary for both the husband and the wife to appropriately identify with each other and exhibit solidarity with one another, even if this might entail a loss of the husband's right to confidentiality. And this is also how some scholars in African philosophy have also justified a loss of confidentiality. They say confidentiality policy raises fear. The policy raises shame and isolation, rejection, anger, stigma, and discrimination, as well as inhibits early diagnosis. Confidentiality policy encourages HIV positive patients to bear their bodies by themselves, rather than share such bodies with those who also care for one's illness. Confidentiality policy also encourages others from caring for HIV 
patients since it sends a message which says that HIV is not a disease like all other diseases that we have to tackle together but the body of the individual. But in African philosophy, a disease is never entirely the body of the individual alone. In Ubuntu philosophy, what affects the individual also affects the community. In fact, the individual and the community are co-substantively constituted in this uh, philosophy. Moreover, an emphasis on partner notification ties very well, in my opinion, with the UN strategies for ending HIV and the AIDS epidemic by 2030. It ensures that those who are at risk of infection are given opportunity to make informed decisions about taking advantage of available preventive options. It will also lower the rates of new infections in several discordant relationships. Now, somebody may make the claim that notifying others, such as informing the wife of the husband's serial conversion, will expose the husband to harm, such as discrimination. The wife may, for example, leave him. His community may expel or ostracize him. Now, I want to say that the aim of my paper, and before I talk about it, if this happens, if the husband is discriminated against, if the wife leaves the husband, it will at least not be a failure of the principles of this philosophy. It will not be the failure of Ubuntu philosophy itself, but a failure of the wife but a failure of the community to be the sort of being Ubuntu mandates. Beings will care for the good of others. Beings will love other persons. Beings will exhibit solidarity for other persons. It is not the aim of this presentation to convince anyone to live by the principles of Ubuntu philosophy or even to argue that current normative frameworks are completely useless and must be replaced by Ubuntu philosophy. Rather, my aim has been to demonstrate that living by the values and the principles of Ubuntu is more conducive to, for achieving the global goal of ending HIV and AIDS epidemic by 2030 and addressing the ethical conflicts between partner notification and patient confidentiality in several discordant relationships. Thank you.
consonant with the Medical Council of India mandate to include ethics training in the medical curriculum from 2009. But uh, today's lecture of Dr. Teams is about the experience of India, the experience of India with surrogate motherhood. We talked in the biotics class about surrogate motherhood and the ethical problem arises from practicing surrogate motherhood. One of the most uh, interesting experiences on surrogate motherhood happened in India. And today we will listen to a lecture that describes the first-hand uh, experience and uh, academic work on the issue in India. Thank you, Dr. Teams, and here is this. Do you have a Thank you, Dr. Aramesh, for that introduction. And I must say I'm very glad to be here at the Edinburgh University and enjoy your hospitality. Especially for me, it is a very great honor to have met Dr. James Drain and interacted with him uh, at the Bioethics Institute. He's a legend, a living legend of our time, and especially a legend uh, in America. So it's my pleasure today to share with you about an issue of bioethical concern in my country, that is the use of technology in medicine. And this is what led to the rise and fall of surrogacy, commercial surrogacy in India. But these are some headlines which sent shockwaves through the medical reproduction uh, establishment in our country in 2016 when the government decided to ban all commercial arrangements in surrogacy. In effect, really, it shouldn't have been such a surprise because as you will see from, uh, from what I share now, there were very substantial events that led to this um, ban on commercial surrogacy in India. So to begin with, let's talk about um, uh, the technology itself. We are speaking here about in vitro fertilization, which is that where the sperm and the ovum meet outside the human body um, in laboratory situations to create an embryo. And this embryo is then transferred into the uterus for gestation and, uh, gestation and childbirth. So this uh, technology has led to various uh, types of in vitro fertilization. You would have heard AIT, AIH, artificial insemination, ZIFT, GIFT, gamete intrafallopian transfer, and ICSI, intracytoplasmic sperm injection. These are all variations of the same medical technology that uh, is used to in, in infertile couples to have children when, they, when infertility is a problem. Uh, with patients. So, you may have heard that around the 1970s, of course, everyone here would know, late 1970s, one would have heard of baby Louise Brown, the first test tube baby, was born in UK, successfully uh, managed uh, in UK, and that was the first test tube baby. But what people probably do not know uh, widely is that just two months after Louise Brown was born, baby Kanupriya was born in a hospital in Calcutta. Now, the reason that is, this is less known is that the, the documentation around this case was incomplete. And so the, the uh, award or the recognition for uh, in vitro fertilization and babies born from it was actually uh, awarded to Dr. Hinduja from, who had who uh, was able to do this in Bombay at the AEM hospital there and that was baby Harsha. So the reason I'm telling you the, this is that the science was already in place. 
uh, in India, even in the late 70s. And already clinicians were developing the technology and beginning to use it way back then. Now coming to the types of surrogacy, surrogacy itself is the use of a third party in reproduction where a couple uses in vitro fertilization and embryo transfer but the embryo transfer happens to the surrogate and the surrogate will carry the pregnancy, give birth to the child and the child is handed over to uh, the parents. So that is surrogacy. Now the types of surrogacy, the traditional one, the genetic surrogacy, where the mother, the surrogate is the biological and genetic mother of the child. So here the surrogate will contribute the ovum, the genetic material that goes into the in vitro fertilization. And the other type of surrogacy, the one which we are all familiar with and which is in use today is the gestational surrogacy where the mother is the biological mother of the child but does not contribute any genetic material. This means that both the, the sperm and the ovum is contributed by others and the mother herself, the surrogate mother herself is not the genetic mother. So in this case there are five possible parents, uh, the intended parents, the genetic parents and the surrogate mother. So altruistic surrogacy is one in which there is no fee for service but this person, this surrogate mother will agree to carry the pregnancy for reasons of compassion or empathy with infertile parents and only her medical bills and certain expenditures will be covered. But in commercial surrogacy, beyond those expenses, there will also be a payment for the service of surrogacy. So in India now, then, soon after the development of this and starting from the 90s, uh, some uh, uh, surrogacy started getting commercialized. The first documented case was of a woman in Gujarat who agreed to carry uh, a surrogate baby for an infertile couple and she agreed to do it for money because she needed that money to, treat, to pay for the treatment of her paralyzed husband. <clears throat> This is the kind of, uh, this is a very uh, popular magazine that I, I have, you have here and uh, they were speaking of suddenly this widespread adoption of the technology and the monetization or the monetizing of this assisted reproductive technologies. The, num the number of infertility clinics began to grow and the number of children born through surrogacy each year grew from around 200 in the late 80s to 2000. So this was this is the kind of image that uh, that people began to understand of the surrogacy industry, where you have uh, this, uh, the, the parents parents who infertile uh, couples who were very grateful to surrogates who were able to give them a child, and this is the kind of image that began uh, when, when this technology was used in the first place. But with the spread of it, with the spread, the, this idea changed and people began to see that there were more dimensions to use of this technology. So what are some of the factors that spawned this industry in India? There were regulatory factors because uh, the regulators and the lawmakers were slow to really, to um, take charge of this technology because they asked questions about whether it was a treatment. Is this a medical treatment? Is infertility a disease? Is it an illness? Is it just a human condition? And uh, would they have to intervene? What do the experts say? They were looking to the, to the medical experts for guidance. And if this is a technology, and in that case, should they be regulating it to the health ministry, which ministry? And so the regulations that emerged were rather inadequate at that time. And this also was one of the factors. Then